the evening light cast a soft glow across the young, emerald green foliage of the forest flanking the highway. The highway itself, with its coarse surface, provided perfect traction for the tyres of Julia's car, which sped along the deserted road. At this late hour, the absence of traffic meant Julia was on track to reach home sooner than anticipated. Julia's satisfaction with life was palpable. The day had culminated in a significant triumph for her, securing a lucrative contract. Now, as she navigated her way home, her heart was at ease, and she hummed a melody, enveloped in a sense of contentment. Beside her lay a briefcase, its contents a substantial sum of money. To some, carrying such an amount without any form of security might seem foolhardy, but for Julia, it was an occasional, albeit risky, practice she had grown accustomed to. The business trip, embarked upon with a mix of hope and uncertainty, had culminated in a resounding success. Her joy was uncontainable. It was no wonder she sang along the winding mountain highway with the dense woods hugging both sides of the road. She eagerly anticipated the comforts of home, a warm shower, a cosy evening in front of the TV. However, the smooth journey was abruptly interrupted. Her car jolted unexpectedly on the otherwise smooth road. Pulling over to the shoulder, she decelerated to a stop. A quick inspection revealed a sudden misfortune. Not one, but both front tyres were punctured. The perfection of the day was marred by this unforeseen setback. Puzzled, Julia circled her car, only to discover the true nature of the incident. It was no mere accident. Spikes, deliberately placed on the road, were the culprits. As she reached for her phone to seek assistance, an unsettling development unfolded. Three figures emerged from the dense woods, their expressions far from friendly. It was evident they had no intention of offering help. Julia found herself facing a situation far more perilous than a simple flat tire. Hey there, beauty, taunted one of the men in a tone dripping with mockery. Seems like you've had a bit of misfortune. What a pity we can't be of much help. However, we might assist in lightening another burden you seem to be carrying, he said with a sly grin, eyeing her briefcase. Cut the nonsense! interjected another, an older member of the trio, his annoyance with his accomplice evident in his tone. He turned to Julia with a more direct demand. Hand over your phone. Julia's heart raced with fear. She understood with chilling clarity that escape from these rogues was unlikely. Though their exact intentions were unknown, she suspected they were after one thing, her briefcase full of cash. In moments of crisis, it's astonishing how swiftly a mind can traverse a lifetime of memories. Julia's life flashed before her eyes in vivid detail. She remembered herself as a seven-year-old girl playing in a sandbox outside a dilapidated trailer, the home she shared with her alcoholic parents. Her thoughts then raced to the decisive moment she chose to leave her parents and their dreary little town behind seeking a brighter future in the city. She recalled the string of odd jobs she had taken up, the most recent being a waitress at a roadside cafe. Her mind lingered on a particular incident at the cafe. A visitor had left behind a ring. Without hesitation, Julia had rushed outside to return it. The owner was an elderly Asian man in a hat, frequently removing the ring from his finger due to discomfort. His eyes met hers with a mix of surprise and gratitude as she handed him the ring. These fleeting memories, encompassing struggles and triumphs, seemed to sharpen her resolve in the face of the imminent threat. The man, Mr. Wang, regarded Julia silently, his gaze intense as he puffed on his cigar. After a moment, he extended a business card towards her. Call me if you ever need my assistance he said in a measured tone before turning away. This brief encounter marked Julia's first interaction with Mr. Wang, 
she tucked the card into her pocket and returned to her duties inside the cafe. Months later, upon leaving her job at the cafe, Julia was sorting through her belongings when she stumbled upon the business card given to her by the Asian man. With a mixture of curiosity and uncertainty, she decided to give him a call, unaware of the direction this would steer her life. Mr. Wang, she soon discovered, was the proprietor of a nationwide chain of upscale jewellery stores. The ring Julia had returned to him held more sentimental than monetary value. But to Mr. Wang, it meant the world. Impressed by her honesty, he offered Julia a position in one of his stores. Julia's career progressed rapidly. She went from a regular sales associate to managing one of the stores. Mr. Wang, a man of elusive presence, was rarely found at work or home. His passion lay in hunting for rare jewellery pieces, a pursuit that was more about personal fulfilment than financial gain. His already successful business empire yielded millions. But it was the stories and histories behind each piece of jewellery that truly captivated him. Intrigued by Mr. Wang's endeavours, Julia expressed a desire to accompany him on his quests. To her surprise, he agreed. During these expeditions, Julia learned the art of acquiring valuable jewellery at reasonable prices, as well as unearthing treasures that others had spent lifetimes searching for. This experience opened Julia's eyes to a lucrative opportunity. She transitioned to working full-time in the trade of rare and valuable jewellery, quickly amassing wealth. In a few short years, Julia's newfound prosperity enabled her to invest in real estate and live a life beyond her wildest childhood dreams. Her journey from a humble beginning to achieving her aspirations was nothing short of remarkable. Jarred back to the present by the unnerving grip of one of the bandits, Julia felt a sudden pang of introspection. Was her pursuit of wealth the root of this dire situation? Did this ambush represent some kind of cosmic retribution? She racked her brain for any misdeeds she might have committed but came up empty. Her career, though ambitious, was built on integrity and hard work. Her thoughts were interrupted as one of the bandits rifled through her pockets before moving towards her car. In a moment of panic, Julia gestured towards her purse on the passenger seat. Everything I have is in that purse, she stammered, her voice tinged with fear. The prospect of losing the briefcase full of cash, hidden from their view, sent shivers down her spine. The leader of the group, with a calculating look, assured her, We'll take the purse, but we're after something more. His eyes then fixed on the briefcase lying on the back seat. In a desperate attempt to mislead them, Julia blurted out, Oh no, that's not mine! But her plea was in vain, as the leader instructed his accomplice, Greg, to silence her. A sudden blow to her head from behind plunged Julia into unconsciousness. When she regained consciousness, she found herself in the dim twilight of the forest, disoriented and struggling to piece together the events that had unfolded. The cold realisation dawned upon her as she discovered she was bound against a tree, unable to move her arms or legs. The dense forest seemed deserted, a place unlikely frequented by passers-by, increasing her sense of despair. The threat of succumbing to the elements, starvation, or even the swarming mosquitoes loomed large. Although screaming seemed futile, it was the only option she could think of. Yet, amidst her fear and confusion, Julia sensed she was not alone. The presence of someone, or something, in the vicinity sent a chill down her spine, and it was clear they were not there to offer help. As Julia strained to listen, a low, menacing growl resonated through the quiet forest. The growling seemed to emanate from multiple sources surrounding her. Oh my God, she murmured, her voice quivering with fear. How had her life 
once so fulfilled and content, spiraled into this nightmare. The thought of becoming prey to wild animals was both terrifying and surreal. As she nervously scanned the surrounding underbrush, her gaze caught flickering movements. The sight of three wolves emerging from the bushes sent her heart racing with dread. Here she was, a recently successful businesswoman, now reduced to potential prey for these forest dwellers. A morbid thought crossed her mind. Perhaps this was a merciful end, sparing her from a prolonged, agonizing demise bound to a tree. Overwhelmed by horror and despair, Julia felt her consciousness waning. In this moment of extreme peril, an unexpected sense of detachment surfaced. The loss of a briefcase full of money, once a significant concern, now seemed trivial in the face of her mortality. Her thoughts, possibly influenced by the onset of delirium, turned towards the wolves. She couldn't help but admire their pristine beauty. Yet, something struck her as odd. The wolves didn't exhibit overt aggression. Instead, they regarded her cautiously from a distance. Julia entertained the whimsical hope that they had already fed before stumbling upon her. This ironic thought elicited a weak chuckle from her. Resigned to her fate, Julia began to mentally bid farewell to life. Reflecting on her journey, she felt a deep sense of gratitude for the years she had lived, despite the current grim circumstances. Her contemplation was abruptly interrupted by a distinctly human voice. Charlie, Cooper, what have you found? Luna, come here. The voice belonged to a boy, seemingly calling out to wolves. Or were they dogs? Struggling to turn her head towards the sound, Julia's eyes fell upon a young boy, about eight years old, approaching through the underbrush. The realization dawned on her that she might have mistaken dogs for wolves. Perhaps the boy, likely accompanied by his parents on a hunting trip, had stumbled upon her by chance. Julia's sense of relief was palpable as the rush of blood to her head signaled a flicker of hope. Her heart pounded with the possibility of rescue. Hey, kid, she called out, her voice echoing with urgency. Please help me. Can you get your parents? The boy, agile and swift, reached her in a few bounds. Who tied you up like this, ma'am? He inquired with a mix of curiosity and concern. Without waiting for her response, he deftly produced a knife from his belt and sliced through the ropes binding her. Julia collapsed onto her side, her limbs aching but grateful for the release. Bandits, she managed to say in a hoarse whisper. I need to get to the city quickly. Are these dogs? Are you here with your parents? They're wolves, not dogs. But don't worry, they're harmless. I'm alone. My dad's in the cabin. It's getting dark. You won't make it to the city now. Come, I'll take you to our place, the boy offered with an air of maturity beyond his years. Julia, acknowledging her debilitated state, cautiously agreed. All right, lead me to your cabin. But how do you manage living here in the woods? It's a simple life, the boy answered with confidence. We've adapted well to it. Julia's anxiety surfaced again as she eyed the wolves. I hope they won't attack me, she said nervously. No, they won't. We've raised them since they were pups. My dad rescued them from poachers. He knows how to handle them, the boy explained with a sense of pride. That's incredible, Julia remarked, impressed, yet still apprehensive. So, have you lived here all your life? What about school? Her questions were more about filling the silence than seeking information. The situation was surreal. A young boy living in the woods with wolves, leading her to an unknown cabin with an unseen father. It was a scenario fraught with uncertainty, but Julia had little choice but to follow and trust this unlikely rescuer. Yes, I've been living here for most of my life, 
though I've visited the city too. Someday, I plan to go to school. I already know reading, writing and arithmetic. Dad's my teacher. We like our life here. I don't feel like leaving, the boy shared with a tone of contentment. Julia, battling fatigue and a growing thirst, inquired, How much further do we have to walk? Keeping pace with the boy's brisk stride was proving challenging. Just a little more, he replied, marching ahead with an ease that spoke of his familiarity with the terrain. At home, Dad will give you food and drink. Don't worry, it's a great place. You'll like it there. Julia mulled over his words sceptically, her mind clouded with doubt. She couldn't shake off the notion that the boy's father might be some hermit or eccentric, choosing isolation in the wilderness, perhaps for reasons best left unexplored. Her hope was that this man, whoever he was, wouldn't harm her. Having already faced a life-threatening situation, Julia felt she had little left to lose. Is the city far from here? She asked, her mind weary from the day's ordeals. It's not very far. I'll show you the way tomorrow. You might get a ride from there. We don't have a car, he explained. As for anyone looking for you, it's unlikely they'll find you here. My dad prefers to avoid strangers. Julia couldn't help but feel a twinge of dark humour at the situation. Great. The father must be some kind of recluse, she thought to herself half-jokingly wondering if he might be a zealot intent on keeping his secrets safe. The journey, despite the boy's assurance of its brevity, felt interminable to Julia. Accustomed to the comforts of city life, she found the rugged forest path arduous, often tripping and clutching at branches for support. After what seemed like an eternity, they arrived at a cabin that was surprisingly well-constructed and not at all small, standing robustly amidst the wilderness. Here's our home, the boy announced, extending a welcoming hand towards the cabin. Come in, you'll soon meet my dad. The father, a stern-looking man, navigated the space with the aid of a walking stick. His greeting to Julia was somewhat reserved, not out of displeasure at her arrival, but seemingly due to self-consciousness about his condition. My son found this lady near the creek, he explained. She encountered bandits who left her tied up and unconscious. She's quite thirsty and exhausted, he relayed, swiftly moving to fetch her a drink. A gentle smile softened the man's features as he listened. Well done, son, he praised, evidently proud of his son's initiative and independence. Turning his attention to Julia, he invited her to sit. Please, make yourself comfortable at the table. I'm brewing some herbal tea. It will be ready shortly. Now, tell me what happened, Ed. Julia recounted her ordeal, detailing the ambush, her encounter with the bandits, and the subsequent loss of her briefcase filled with money. As she spoke, she reflected on the bandits' behaviour, deducing that they were more interested in the briefcase than in harming her. Their choice to leave her tied up in the forest suggested they hoped nature would eliminate any trace of their crime. Julia allowed herself a small, wry smile. I suppose you're right. In a way, wild animals did indeed take care of me, she mused reflecting on the irony of her situation. Luke, the father, handed her a cup of warm, aromatic tea. Along with it, he set out some simple yet hearty food on the table, inviting Parker to join them for the meal. The boy dove into his dinner with enthusiasm, while Julia, still shaken from the day's events, politely declined, finding herself devoid of appetite. Breaking a brief silence, Julia turned to her young rescuer. I haven't even asked your name. I'm Julia, and you are? I'm Parker, he answered with a hint of pride. It's nice to meet you, Parker, Julia said warmly, then shifted her attention to the man. 
And you are? I'm Luke, he replied in a measured tone. As dinner progressed, Parker's eyelids began to droop, though he seemed reluctant to leave the company. Julian noticed how Luke's demeanour softened when he interacted with his son, a stark contrast to the gruff exterior he presented initially. It was clear there was a deep bond of love and understanding between father and son. Eventually, Parker bid them good night and retreated behind a partition. Luke then addressed Julia's accommodations. You must be tired. I'll set up a place for you to sleep here. Tomorrow, Parker can guide you to the bus station. It's a bit of a trek and easy to lose your way. Julia expressed her concern about Parker's solitary wanderings. Is it safe for him to roam the forest alone? Luke nodded, a hint of pride in his voice. Our wolves are always with him. Besides, I can't accompany him very far given my condition. He's grown up here and he's well accustomed to the forest. But why choose this life? Julia inquired, her curiosity genuine. Don't you miss regular interactions, like taking your son to school, having friends, and a community? We've been living this way for over six years now, even before we often retreated to these woods. I'm not some hermit or eccentric. I'm fully aware of the social needs of a child. I loved it here, until I had a run-in with poachers. The incident left me with a gunshot wound in the leg, he explained, patting his hip for emphasis. Parkers adapted well to this life. If we went back to the city, I fear they might separate him from me. He's practically grown up in these woods, and I worry how he'd adjust to city life. It might seem selfish, but it's our reality, Luke concluded with a hint of resignation. Julia then broached a delicate subject. What about Parker's mother? Where is she? Luke's expression shifted slightly at the mention of his wife. She left us long before my injury. Our relationship was strained from the beginning. We married only because of Parker's impending birth. She left when he was three, with another man. We haven't heard from her since. I imagine if she knew about your situation, she might return, at least for Parker's sake. Julia said, trying to understand such abandonment. She couldn't fathom leaving a child, especially in such unique circumstances. Luke shook his head. I doubt she would come back. Her departure wasn't about my injury, and honestly, I don't want her to return. If she did, it's likely she'd take Parker, and he'd end up in an orphanage. You might find it hard to believe, but she was quite indifferent to him. Julia awoke the next morning feeling remarkably rejuvenated. Surprisingly, the aches in her legs and head had vanished, and her spirits were high. Luke and Parker had prepared breakfast for her, and to her gratitude, Luke even offered her some money for her journey back to the city. Thank you so much, Julia expressed sincerely. Your home is truly beautiful. May I visit you again sometime? I feel indebted to you for your kindness and for Parker's bravery in rescuing me. Feel free to visit. I'm not usually keen on having guests, but you're more than welcome. Don't think of it as a debt. We were glad to help, Luke responded with a hint of warmth. After heartfelt goodbyes, Julia and Parker set out for the station. Parker explained that while it was a bit further than the highway where she might hitch a ride, the station was a more reliable option. As they walked, the wolves kept a discreet distance, their presence a silent reassurance. Julia, curious about the boy's unusual companions, asked, Don't people get scared seeing you with such unique pets? Isn't it strange for them? They do get startled, Parker admitted, but I won't go all the way to the station. I'll just show you the way, then watch from a distance to make sure you get there safely. I keep the wolves away so they don't attract attention. They're smart and don't approach people, he explained with a sense of pride. As they walked, Parker spoke enthusiastically about his life in the forest. During a lull in the conversation, 
Julia seized the opportunity to ask, Don't you ever wish to connect with other kids, to play and go to school like them? Parker took a moment to consider Julia's question, reflecting the thoughtfulness beyond his years. He was a boy of few words, speaking only when necessary, and his response was carefully measured. I haven't ruled out living in the city, he began slowly. I do love the wolves, but they're not the only reason I'm here. My dad loves this life, and he's reluctant to leave. I can't leave him behind. I love him and want to be by his side, Parker explained, with a maturity that belied his age. Julia could sense the weight of the conversation on Parker. His thoughtful response indicated he had often pondered over these matters. Recognising the depth of his reflections, she decided not to probe further. Instead, she made a mental note to revisit them and offer whatever assistance she could once her own affairs were in order. As they continued their walk, the time seemed to fly by, filled with their conversation. Soon, the distant sounds of station announcements began to filter through the trees, signalling their approach. We're here, Parker announced, stopping at the edge of the forest. I won't go further. The wolves might get anxious around people, and they could lose track of me. Just cross this field, and you'll reach the station. I hope you have a safe trip. Thank you, Parker, Julia said, embracing him and planting a gentle kiss on his cheek. His reaction was heartwarming yet poignant, highlighting the absence of maternal affection in his life. As tears welled up in her eyes, Julia felt a surge of compassion for the boy. Parker, with a hint of hope in his voice, asked, You promised to visit. Will you keep your promise? Absolutely, I'll come back. But I must admit, I'm not great with forest navigation. I'll just head in this general direction from the station. I'll sort out my matters and return in about a week. And if I get lost, I'm counting on you or your wolves to find me, okay? Parker's parting advice was practical. If you need to find your way back here, just whistle like this, he said, demonstrating a distinct whistle for Julia. After bidding farewell, Julia made her way toward the station. Glancing back, she noticed Parker had already disappeared. Her mind was preoccupied with thoughts of the boy and his father, but stepping into the bus station building, she was abruptly reminded of her own pressing issues. She pondered over the robbery, questioning if there had been a leak from her colleagues or partners about her carrying money. The suspects were few, but this didn't simplify the matter. In the station's waiting hall, a woman was intently watching a television. Suddenly, she exclaimed to an employee named Leslie, Look, they're covering our area in the news. There's been another incident on the highway, a car fire this time. She turned up the volume, drawing more attention. Julia, intrigued, joined the small crowd. The news anchor reported, The car was completely destroyed, but the owner has been identified by the license plate as Julia Loden, a well-known businesswoman. Her husband recognised some of her personal items among the debris. Troy, Julia's husband, appeared on screen next, his voice heavy with grief, pleading for a thorough investigation. The police suspect that Ms. Loudon may not have perished in the fire. There are several unanswered questions, the anchor concluded. Julia, stunned and bewildered, purchased a bus ticket and embarked on her journey home. Upon arrival, she was met with the unsettling sight of her house and gate locked. The locks evidently changed, barring her from entering her own home. Julia stood perplexed outside her own home, unable to comprehend why the locks had been changed during her brief absence of just three days. With her phone destroyed by the bandits and her husband's whereabouts unknown, she felt a growing sense of isolation and urgency. Lingering outside wasn't an option. Determined to seek answers, 
Julia headed to her office. On her way, she unexpectedly spotted her husband, Troy, through the windows of a nearby store. He was perusing wine bottles, seemingly at ease. Intrigued and cautious, Julia lingered outside for a moment before deciding to confront him. Just as she was about to enter, a woman emerged from an aisle, greeting Troy with a warm embrace and a smile. The sight ignited a fury within Julia. She stormed into the store, approaching them with a mix of shock and anger. Without a word, Julia confronted Troy with a slap, accusingly yelling, Buried me already, huh, you bastard! Troy, taken aback, stuttered, Julia, what in the world? The woman with him, Riley, recoiled in shock at the scene unfolding. Julia demanded explanations. What the heck are you doing with this woman? Who is she? Troy hurriedly tried to defuse the situation. Julia, please, she's just a colleague from work. Sorry, Riley, he said, addressing the woman who, Julia noticed, was quite attractive. Then, turning back to his wife, he continued, You're alive, my dear. How happy I am. I can't believe it. Julia was sceptical of Troy's explanation. Her feelings towards him had been distant for some time, and this incident only added to her doubts. However, she realised that the immediate priority was to investigate the attempt on her life. We need to go to the police, Troy, Julia said firmly, setting aside her personal turmoil for the moment to focus on unravelling the mystery of the recent events. Julia's husband, Troy, politely excused himself from Riley, his colleague, and followed Julia to the police station, visibly perplexed and trying to make sense of the situation. Julia had regained some composure, but struggled to articulate the full extent of her ordeal, still grappling with the confusion of the events herself. At the police station, she narrated her experience, deliberately omitting the details about the father and son she had encountered. She noticed Troy becoming increasingly nervous, which only heightened her suspicions. Once they stepped outside the police station, Julia didn't hesitate to confront him. I saw the news report. You mentioned a large sum of money I was carrying. How did you know about that? She asked pointedly. Troy seemed flustered. You mentioned a potential sale before leaving. I thought it might help the police if they knew there was a significant sum involved. I believed it would intensify their search efforts, he explained. Julia pressed further. And how could you recognise my belongings among the charred items? Troy's frustration was evident. Is this an interrogation? I've already answered these questions for the police. They showed me some items they found. I simply agreed they could be yours, given they were retrieved from your car. I don't understand why you're questioning me like this. Undeterred, Julia continued. Then explain why you changed the locks at our house. His response came with a hint of defensiveness. It was a precaution recommended due to the criminal nature of your presumed death. With the perpetrators still at large, it seemed wise to secure our home. Troy's agitation grew as he spoke, and after a pause, he added, I don't get why you're treating me with such suspicion. You've already attacked me in public and embarrassed me in front of a colleague. He took a deep breath before continuing. I never believed you were dead, and now I'm lost as to what we're even discussing. Are you accusing me of something? If so, just say it. Nothing, Troy. If I had any specific suspicions, I'd have shared them. Let's just go home. I need some time to gather myself and rest, Julia said, her voice tinged with exhaustion. Deep down, she was troubled by Troy's behaviour, which had raised a cloud of suspicion in her mind. But for the moment, she yearned for rest. Reflecting on her recent experiences, Julia realised her feelings towards Troy had shifted. She couldn't pinpoint why, but her trust in him had eroded. Opting to delay confronting these issues without solid evidence, 
Julia's thoughts drifted back to the father and son she had met in the forest. Their sincerity had left an indelible impression on her. The next day, acknowledging that her personal troubles were far from resolved, Julia began planning a return visit to the forest. Unsure of what gifts to bring, she decided on an assortment of tasty and unique food items, books and toys for Parker, hoping to bring a touch of joy to their simple life. Though she knew these gifts might not meet all their needs, she comforted herself with the thought of asking them directly for their preferences on her next visit. Upon reaching the forest, Julia ventured towards where she believed the cabin to be. The journey was lengthy, and her backpack weighed heavily on her shoulders. Doubts crept in about finding the correct path. But just as Parker had instructed, the wolves appeared first, heralding her arrival. Soon after, Parker emerged from the foliage, his face alight with joy at seeing her again. You came! Parker exclaimed, breaking from his usual reserve as he rushed forward to embrace Julia. She returned the hug with a delighted laugh. I'm so thrilled to see you, Parker. I was worried I'd get lost and never find my way here, Julia admitted. I didn't expect you so soon. I knew you were close when the wolves started howling differently, Parker said, a hint of wonder in his voice. They made their way to the cabin where Luke greeted her with a subdued warmth. His reserved demeanour couldn't mask his pleasure at seeing a familiar face from the outside world again. Julia unpacked the treats from her backpack, feeling slightly self-conscious. I hope you like these. I wasn't sure exactly what to bring. I didn't ask last time, but I do hope we'll meet again, she said. Parker's eyes lit up as he perused the books. We're not really sure what we need. We've gotten used to having just the essentials, but these are fascinating. Thank you so much, he responded with genuine gratitude. Luke interjected. You shouldn't have gone to all this trouble, but thank you. I'll get some tea ready. Let's enjoy lunch together. Julia then mentioned her oversight. I didn't bring anything for the wolves. I wasn't sure what to get them. I know they eat meat, but it would have been too heavy to carry. That's all right, Parker assured her. They're quite self-sufficient and can find their own food. They're just happy you're here, gifts or not. So are we, he added with a smile. As Julia observed Parker and his unique companions, it dawned on her how different his life was from most children. He may not have had typical childhood experiences, but he had friendships and connections that many could only imagine. As Parker disappeared outside to play with the wolves, embracing the freedom and companionship they offered, Julia took the opportunity to share her recent experiences with Luke in more detail. She confided her suspicions about her husband and mentioned her visit to the police, assuring Luke that she had kept their existence in the forest a secret. Their conversation meandered through various topics, touching upon life in the forest and other casual subjects. An awkward silence eventually settled between them, during which Luke stood up, breaking the quiet. I'll go gather some firewood for tonight. It tends to get chilly, he said, excusing himself to step outside. Left alone, Julia took a moment to appreciate the cabin's cosy and homely interior. She pondered what life would be like living in such a secluded environment for as long as Luke and Parker had. Her gaze fell upon quaint wooden figurines on the window sills, evidence of Luke's craftsmanship and the ways he filled his time. While exploring the cabin, Julia accidentally brushed against a curtain that concealed Parker's bed. A photograph caught her eye, a young, beautiful woman. She paused, struck by the familiarity of the face. It was the same woman she had seen with her husband just days before. Luke re-entered the cabin at that moment and noticed Julia's fixation on the photo. He offered an explanation. That's my ex-wife, Parker's mother. Despite everything, we keep her picture. 
I wanted Parker to have some memory of his mother. I cherished my mother deeply and understand the importance of maternal love. But Parker shows little interest in her, likely due to her lack of affection and her eventual abandonment. So, the photo remains, more as a forgotten artefact than anything of significance to us. Julia, with a new sense of urgency, questioned Luke with careful intention. What's her name? Riley, he replied, confirming Julia's suspicions. She chose not to reveal her recent encounter with Riley, feeling it best to keep this information to herself for the time being. The realisation of the connection between her husband, Troy, and Riley set Julia's mind racing. The pieces of the puzzle were starting to align, prompting a sudden need to return to the city. I've enjoyed my time here, Luke, but I have to leave. There are things I need to address back home, she explained, her tone laced with a newfound determination. Seems like this isn't over yet, she added cryptically. Luke looked at her, a hint of confusion in his gaze, but he didn't press for clarity. Julia departed without saying goodbye to Parker, not wanting to cause him any additional distress. Once back in the city, she found that the police investigation was stagnating due to a lack of evidence. Her mind was consumed with trying to unravel the connection between Troy and Riley. While she had long suspected Troy's infidelity, it was not the infidelity itself that troubled her now. Troy's recent behavior had been unusually cautious. He had taken leave from work, making it difficult for Julia to track his movements. She was determined to find out if he was meeting with Riley. Julia had noticed something more complex and intriguing about Riley than initially apparent. After several failed attempts to follow Troy discreetly, she devised a new strategy. She informed Troy that she would be away for a week even going as far as purchasing plane tickets to lend credence to her story. She left the ticket receipt casually on the kitchen table, hoping to mislead him without raising suspicion. To ensure Troy was entirely convinced, Julia drove to the airport, suspecting that he might have placed trackers on her car. After leaving her car in the airport parking lot, Julia discreetly rented another vehicle and drove back to her neighbourhood. She parked a safe distance from her house, ensuring she wouldn't be noticed, and settled in for a stakeout. As the evening set in, a car arrived at her house. To her dismay, but not her surprise, Troy had brazenly invited Riley over. Julia's suspicion of infidelity was confirmed, but her focus was on a bigger picture. She spent the entire night vigilant, watching over the house. The dimmed lights and quiet suggested what was happening inside. When morning arrived, Riley emerged and drove away. Julia discreetly followed, successfully obtaining Riley's home address. Julia spent the next few days shadowing Riley, who seemed to spend her time in coffee shops, making calls and meeting various people. However, no significant information surfaced from these observations. The breakthrough came unexpectedly. One day, Riley visited a particular residence that left Julia in shock. It was Mr. Wang's house, the connection between Riley and the man who had been a mentor and a pivotal figure in Julia's life deepened the mystery. Feeling a need to reconnect with Mr. Wang and perhaps find some answers, Julia decided to visit him. She bought a small, elegant cake as a gesture of gratitude and respect. Upon knocking on Mr. Wang's door, it was opened by an older woman, likely a housekeeper. The woman's smile was peculiar, almost as if she had been expecting Julia's visit at that very moment. Mr. Wang, please come down, the lady called out, her voice echoing through the spacious hallway. Hurry, Mr. Wang, you must see who has arrived. From a room situated at the far end of the hall, Mr. Wang made his appearance. Initially, his gaze rested on Julia, yet there was no flicker of recognition in his eyes. 
With each step, he took towards the entrance. He fumbled slightly with his glasses, finally perching them on the bridge of his nose. As he neared Julia, now only a few paces away, recognition dawned on his features. A warm, welcoming smile spread across his face. Mirroring his expression, Julia's face lit up with a smile of her own, a sense of familiarity and comfort settling in the air between them. Hello, Mr. Wang. It's been too long, Julia greeted him warmly. Mr. Wang, with a gentle demeanour, embraced her in a welcoming hug. Their conversation flowed effortlessly for over an hour, weaving through past memories, their shared adventures, and the time they had spent together. Mr. Wang's joy at seeing her was palpable, filling the room with a sense of nostalgic happiness. However, amidst the pleasant reminiscing, Julia steered the conversation towards the primary reason for her visit. Mr. Wang, how do you know Riley? she inquired cautiously. The mention of Riley's name caused a visible reaction in Mr. Wang. He removed his glasses and rubbed his eyes, betraying a sudden weariness. He gazed at Julia with a questioning look, but she, equally perplexed, offered no further explanation. Mr. Wang sighed deeply, his gaze drifting to the window as he gathered his thoughts. Riley, she's always been a bundle of energy. Too much for such a seemingly sweet girl, Mr. Wang began, his tone indicating he understood the gravity of Julia's inquiry. Mr. Wang paused, collecting his thoughts with care. His words, when they came, were laden with significance, hinting at revelations he had never shared before. The room fell into a profound silence, punctuated only by a solitary tear that traced a path down Mr. Wang's cheek. After a few minutes, he broke the silence, ready to disclose truths that had remained unspoken until now. Mr. Wang's story unfolded with a poignant heaviness. He shared about a time when he had everything he could have wished for. A successful business, a loving family with a beautiful wife and three daughters, and the financial freedom to fulfill his dreams. Among these dreams was owning a small yacht, a symbol of his success and a means to explore the open seas. In a gesture of celebration, he had planned a family trip on the yacht. However, his children, uncomfortable with the ocean, wished to return to the beach. Mr. Wang, eager to share his passion, persuaded them to venture further out to sea. Tragically, what began as a minor shift in the wind quickly escalated into a violent storm. The ocean, once a source of wonder and freedom, transformed into a merciless force that claimed the lives of his entire family, leaving Mr. Wang to navigate a world of profound loss and solitude. Julia listened, understanding now the depth of Mr. Wang's empathy towards girls, who invariably reminded him of his daughters. This explained his tendency to hire predominantly female staff at his jewellery stores and his interest in family stories. It also shed light on why he had once formed a special bond with Julia, seeing in her a reflection of his own daughter. However, this dynamic shifted dramatically with Riley's entry into Mr. Wang's life. She began as just another employee, but soon recognised and exploited Mr. Wang's vulnerability towards young women. Unbeknownst to him, Riley grew increasingly resentful of the fatherly affection he showed towards Julia, who, by then, was no longer working for him. Julia had never met Riley during her time with Mr. Wang, but the seeds of jealousy and manipulation had already been sown. Julia's visit to Mr. Wang had illuminated many hidden facets of her past and present. She learned about the depth of Mr. Wang's attachment to her, an emotional connection he had harboured silently, never revealing it to her. Julia's departure to focus on her business had left a void in Mr. Wang's life, 
often leading him to speak of her with fondness and admiration to his employees. Riley, hearing of Julia frequently, had developed an intense resentment towards her, a jealousy born out of Mr. Wang's evident affection for Julia. This revelation brought clarity to Julia's understanding of the complex dynamics at play. She left Mr. Wang's house with a heavy heart, grateful for his honesty but burdened by the newfound knowledge. Julia's subsequent investigation into Riley's relationship with Troy revealed that he was largely a pawn in Riley's manipulative game. Over the next few days, Julia contemplated her next move, eventually deciding to confront Riley directly. However, her first attempt to do so was unsuccessful, as Riley was not home. As Julia headed back to her car, she noticed several envelopes scattered on the sidewalk. Among them was one from a local clinic's oncology department addressed to Riley. Curious but respectful, Julia placed all the envelopes back into the mailbox and left. Determined, Julia returned the following day only to find Riley's house empty again. She then decided to visit the clinic indicated on the envelope. At the clinic, she inquired about Riley only to be told there was no patient by that name. As the receptionist left to check further, Riley herself appeared from another room. Riley's surprise at seeing Julia was unmistakable. Her reaction was a mix of shock and feigned happiness as she hastily composed herself to appear pleasantly surprised by Julia's presence. Riley's initial reaction to seeing Julia at the clinic was one of genuine surprise. Hey, Julia, how have you been? I didn't expect to see you here. Is everything okay? She inquired, her concern appearing sincere. Riley, I know everything, Julia stated bluntly, her words striking Riley, who visibly paled at the implication. Wishing to avoid a public scene, Julia gestured for Riley to join her outside. They found a nearby bench where they sat down for a more private conversation. I'm not here about Troy, Julia began, watching Riley's reaction closely. You can have him. I'm not concerned about that. I'm here for a different reason, she said, causing Riley to tense in anticipation. Julia continued, I know you weren't involved in the robbery. I've seen your financial struggles with overdrafts. I also met your ex-husband and your son, whom you abandoned. But there's one thing I don't understand. You seem to be connected to every aspect of my life, including Mr. Wang. I need answers, Julia stated, her gaze fixed on Riley. Riley exhaled deeply, her initial shock giving way to a sad resignation. She looked down, seemingly grappling with guilt. After a moment of silence, she began to share her story. I always knew this would catch up to me one day, Riley started. She described her childhood, marked by an abusive father and a lack of love. Despite her beauty, she grew up feeling deeply insecure and developed a strong resentment towards men. Her narrative hinted at a troubled past, possibly explaining the complex motivations behind her actions and decisions. Riley's narrative revealed a complex tapestry of emotions and actions, deeply rooted in her troubled past. When she encountered Mr. Wang, she found in him the father figure she had always longed for. However, her newfound sense of belonging was marred by jealousy whenever Mr. Wang mentioned Julia, whom he evidently held in high regard. Riley struggled to accept that Julia, in her eyes, seemed more valued and cherished by Mr. Wang. Driven by envy and a desire to cause Julia pain, Riley initiated a secret relationship with Troy. She naively believed that this would be a form of revenge, only to discover that Julia's attachment to Troy wasn't as deep as she had assumed. In a desperate move to escalate her vendetta, 
Riley hired a group of bandits to intimidate Julia, but her plan spiraled dangerously out of control. The bandits, upon discovering the large amount of cash Julia carried, deviated from Riley's original intent. When they informed Riley of their decision to eliminate Julia, panic set in. Realizing the gravity of the situation, Riley suggested they abandon Julia in the forest, hoping against hope that she would be discovered and saved. Riley was aware of Luke and Parker's presence in the forest and clung to the slim chance that their wolves might find Julia. Riley's story laid bare the extent to which her childhood traumas had influenced her life choices and actions. As she concluded her tale, Julia was left speechless, struggling to process the barrage of revelations. The intertwining of their lives, woven through a series of manipulations and coincidences, left Julia torn between feelings of animosity and pity for Riley. Lost in thought, Julia was startled when a doctor appeared, indicating that Riley was next for her treatment. As the doctor departed, Julia looked at Riley with a mix of confusion and curiosity. Riley, her gaze distant and contemplative, finally broke the silence, ready to reveal yet another layer of her complex story. Riley's voice held a hint of resignation as she shared the news. I recently found out I have cancer. There was a brief pause, a moment of reflection, before she added with a wry smile, I guess I'm paying for my sins. Despite the gravity of her words, the smile that crept onto her face was her first, offering a glimpse of her attempt to face the situation with a touch of humour or perhaps acceptance. Julia, in an unexpected gesture of compassion, thanked Riley for her honesty. Despite the whirlwind of emotions and revelations, she recognised the value of this newfound clarity. Leaving the clinic, Julia felt the weight of the day's discoveries pressing heavily upon her. Contemplating her next steps, Julia grappled with whether to provide the police with the full details of Riley's involvement. Doing so would inevitably lead to Riley's arrest and potential imprisonment, a decision Julia found herself hesitating to make. The situation with Troy had become clear. Their relationship was irreparably damaged, and divorce seemed the inevitable conclusion. When Julia confronted Troy about his affair with Riley, his apologies and explanations were met with her dispassionate acceptance. She simply told him that he could be with Riley. Troy moved out within a week, a rapid departure that nonetheless brought Julia a sense of relief from the pretense that had marked their recent interactions. In a subsequent meeting with Riley, Julia broached the topic of Parker. Riley, burdened with shame over abandoning her son, felt it was too late to make amends. She expressed no desire to return to Parker's life, acknowledging that he likely had no memory or affection for her. Her priorities had shifted drastically, leaving no room for her past as a mother. Julia then visited Mr. Wang, bearing a bouquet of flowers not intended for him. He welcomed her warmly, pleased by her return. Julia shared the details of her conversation with Riley, revealing the tangled web of connections and the resolutions that had emerged from it. Julia's parting words to Mr. Wang were filled with gratitude and a sense of familial bond. I'll always be grateful for everything you've done for me, Mr. Wang. I'll always be there for you, like a daughter. But right now, Riley needs your support more than anyone else, she expressed earnestly. She believed that encouraging Mr. Wang to support Riley was the best help she could offer. It was an opportunity for Riley to experience the paternal care she had longed for and for Mr. Wang, a chance to extend his kindness to someone in dire need. Mr. Wang, deeply moved by Julia's compassion and wisdom, listened in silent appreciation. His smile reflected admiration for the person Julia had become. They shared a heartfelt hug before parting ways. As Julia prepared to leave, 
she offered one last piece of information. I'm going to take some time away from all this. If you need me, don't hesitate to reach out. Riley knows how to find me. Mr. Wang was left pondering Julia's words, but for her, the path was clear. She was headed to the forest, to the cabin that had become a place of refuge and clarity. This journey through the woods was different for Julia. There was no panic or fear, only a heart filled with hope and warmth. She walked confidently, almost certain that the wolves were nearby, watching over her protectively. As she emerged from the dense forest, the sight of the cabin brought a sense of achievement and relief. Approaching the cabin, Julia noticed the homely surroundings, with various tools and items strewn about. Luke and Parker were busy outside, working on a fence for their small garden. Parker skillfully handled his knife, peeling sticks for the fence. Julia's arrival at the cabin was a quiet one, her approach almost unnoticed as she seamlessly blended into the tranquil rhythm of Luke and Parker's work. She set down her backpack, pulled out work gloves and picked up a few sticks, joining Parker in his task. Her sudden presence took Parker by surprise, but his shock quickly turned to joy as he recognised her. You promised we would build this fence together, right? Julia said with a smile, her eyes sparkling with warmth. Parker, you're back! Parker exclaimed, his voice filled with delight as he leaped into Julia's embrace. The hug they shared was a profound moment for Julia, awakening within her a maternal affection she hadn't known she possessed. Embracing Parker, Julia felt an unexpected connection, despite the complicated relationship with his mother, Riley. It was as if she was holding her own son. Luke approached with a broad smile, joining in the warm welcome. When Julia released Parker, she turned to embrace Luke as well. I plan to stay much longer this time, she announced, a hint of joy in her voice. Parker's reaction was one of pure elation, his dream of having a mother figure seemingly fulfilled. Luke, observing this unfolding bond, sensed the beginning of a new chapter. The presence of Julia in their home promised a warmth and completeness that had been absent for too long. In the woods, Julia found a sense of fulfillment far removed from her previous life's pursuit of wealth and luxury. The serene environment offered her inner peace and contentment. Parker became her constant companion, eagerly assisting and protectively shadowing her. His devotion was so complete that it almost seemed he had forgotten about Luke, who watched the bond between Julia and Parker with a mixture of amusement and gratitude. The transformation of life in the cabin with the arrival of Julia was profound. Evenings were spent in shared warmth and laughter as Luke and Julia sipped herbal tea, exchanging stories under the stars. These moments of companionship slowly reignited something in Luke's heart, a feeling he thought had long been extinguished. Julia, with her gentle presence, brought back a spark of life and affection in him. After a few months, a tender moment unfolded between them. Luke, with a newfound vulnerability, reached out to hold Julia's hand and kissed her softly. It marked the start of a deeper connection between them, a bond that went beyond friendship. Around the bonfire, the trio found their own little world of happiness. Julia would read stories to Parker, and on one such night, as a tale of a mother and her son concluded, Parker, holding Julia's hand and looking up with sleepy eyes, asked, Can you be my mother? Julia was overcome with emotion. She held back tears as she knelt down to Parker's level and replied, I thought I already was. Parker's embrace in response was all the confirmation she needed. From that day, Parker no longer called her Julia. She was mom to him. A year passed, and their bond as a family only grew stronger. But one morning, 
a moment of concern shattered the peace. Julia was found outside, clinging to a tree, visibly distressed. Parker and Luke, alarmed, ran to her side. Julia's distress was palpable, and without hesitation, they prepared to rush to the city for medical help. The concern that had shadowed Luke and Parker as they waited for Julia outside the doctor's office was unfounded. Julia's sickness wasn't due to food poisoning, but something entirely different and joyous. When Julia emerged from the doctor's office with a beaming smile, Luke and Parker were instantly relieved. She embraced them both, then turned to Parker with a sparkle in her eye. How would you feel about having a little sister? She asked gently. Luke's reaction was immediate. A mix of relief and joy washed over him as he covered his face with his hands, tears of happiness welling up in his eyes. Parker, initially puzzled, soon grasped the meaning of her words, and his face lit up with excitement, his energy bubbling over as he began to jump around. The doctor recommended that they stay in the city for a while to conduct necessary tests and ensure everything was going well with Julia's pregnancy. This turned into an opportunity for the family to explore the city, a pleasant change of pace for Luke and Parker, who had been secluded in the forest for so long. One evening at a restaurant, Luke seemed unusually restless, frequently stepping away from the table. Then, in a heartwarming surprise, he suddenly knelt beside Julia, a small box in hand. Inside was a delicate diamond ring. Julia's reaction was a mix of amusement and love. Of course I'll marry you. What took you so long? She said, her voice filled with laughter and affection. Their joyous moment was made even more special by Luke's creative planning. Taking advantage of their time in the city, Luke had unexpectedly reached out to his ex-wife, Riley, for assistance with the wedding arrangements. Despite their complicated past, Riley contributed to organising their wedding, which was set to take place in a quaint, picturesque garden. The wedding of Julia and Luke was an intimate affair, with only their closest friends and family invited. Julia was aware of the wedding, but unaware of the special guests Luke had arranged as a surprise. As she stood beside Luke at the altar, she recognised familiar faces among the attendees, including Mr Wang and Riley, as well as a few other acquaintances. Parker, dressed smartly in a tuxedo, was guiding two people towards the altar. Julia watched them approach, and slowly, realisation dawned upon her. They were her parents. Tears welled up in their eyes, mirroring Julia's own emotional response. Luke, aware of Julia's long-held wish to reconcile with her parents, had orchestrated this reunion, fulfilling a dream she had shared during their time in the woods. The reunion was deeply emotional, with both Julia and her parents asking each other for forgiveness. The wedding ceremony, amidst these heartfelt reconciliations, was incredibly moving. Riley, observing from a distance, was visibly emotional as she watched Parker, her son. She refrained from revealing her identity to him, instead choosing a quiet moment to express her gratitude to Julia. Thank you, Julia, for taking care of them, Riley whispered. Julia, with understanding and compassion, responded, Thank you for everything, Riley. Good luck. With that, Riley quietly departed from the ceremony. Eight months later, the family welcomed a new addition, a baby girl named Amy, a name symbolising love. Amy's arrival reinforced the belief that love has the power to heal and forgive, a sentiment that had become the cornerstone of their lives. In this new chapter, the family embraced the joys and challenges of life, united by the bonds of love, forgiveness and newfound connections. As the years passed, Julia, Luke, Parker and little Amy became a close-knit, loving family. The cabin in the woods 
which had been a sanctuary and a starting point for their new life together, remained a special place for them. Despite living in the city, they often returned to the cabin, where the simplicity of life and the beauty of nature provided a welcome escape from the hustle and bustle of urban living. Each visit to the cabin was like stepping into a world where time slowed down, allowing them to savour every moment together. Parker, now an older brother, took great pride in introducing Amy to the wonders of the forest. He showed her the hidden paths, the secret spots where wildflowers bloomed, and of course, the wolves. The wolves, ever watchful guardians of the forest, had become an integral part of their story. Amy, fearless and fascinated by the wolves, quickly learned to respect and admire these majestic creatures under Parker's guidance. The wolves, in turn, seemed to accept and recognise the family as part of their extended pack. Around the Bonfire, the family would gather, sharing stories and making plans for the future. Luke and Julia, hand in hand, watched their children play and grow, their hearts full of gratitude and love. The laughter of Parker and Amy echoed through the trees, a testament to the joy and peace they had found in this magical place. As the stars twinkled above and the fire crackled, the family felt a deep connection, not only to each other, but also to the land and the wolves that had played such a vital role in their journey. The cabin in the woods remained their haven, a symbol of their love, resilience, and the extraordinary journey that had brought them together. In this serene setting, surrounded by the beauty of nature and the company of each other, Julia, Luke, Parker, and Amy lived their lives with a profound appreciation for each moment, each adventure, and the unbreakable bonds they had formed. Their story, woven with threads of love, forgiveness, and second chances, continued to unfold under the watchful eyes of the wolves, amidst the whispering trees of the forest they called their second home. 